In 2013, a group of archaeologists conducted excavations along the shores of the Red Sea, about 154 miles from the Egyptian capital Cairo. Led by French archaeologist Pierre Talet of the Paris Sorbonne, the group has been working seasonally in the area since discovering a boat storage depot about two years ago. Little did they suspect, however, that just this year they would make one of the most spectacular archaeological discoveries of the 21st century, an artifact that could provide the answer to one of history's greatest mysteries, how the Great Pyramid of Giza was built. In the midst of the vast Giza plateau rises an impressive complex of monumental structures built more than 4,600 years ago. The largest among them is the Great Pyramid of Khufu, or better known as Cheops in Greek. With its impressive height, the pyramid remained the tallest structure in the world until the Cathedral Temple was built in Lincoln, England. For explorers and us alike, the building of the pyramid at Giza is one of the most impressive feats of the ancients. No pyramid before or since has surpassed this engineering marvel. Although today we can certainly construct buildings that are at least ten times taller than the Great Pyramid of Giza, its sheer grandeur leads many to question how the ancient Egyptians managed to build it. Thousands of years later, we still don't know for sure how the ancients built it without the help of modern machinery, such as cranes, hydraulic lifts, and motorized vehicles. Khufu itself, too, is a mystery. Reigning in the old kingdom of ancient Egypt as the second pharaoh of the fourth dynasty, he was undoubtedly an extremely powerful ruler at the time, as evidenced by his legacy. Not only did he build one of the seven wonders of the world when civilization was still in its dawn, but he also ruled during a period of prosperity, extending Egypt's borders all the way to the Red Sea. After his death, it has been suggested that the massive pyramid was to become his final resting place. This does not seem to have happened, however, because the sarcophagus found in the burial chamber was empty, and the pharaoh's remains have not been found to this day. Unfortunately, these minor details are all we know about him. Similarly, the Great Pyramid of Khufu and the surrounding necropolis have largely remained a mystery for more than 4,600 years. From scientists to the common man, it seems almost impossible to many that the ancient Egyptians could have achieved such an engineering marvel. Although scientists have offered various explanations, the question of how exactly they did it remains without a definitive answer and still has us scratching our heads. This leads to the suggestion of out-of-this-world explanations, such as the theory that the pyramids were built with the help of alien civilizations. It is because of the seeming impossibility of this task and the lack of definitive proof that many believe the Egyptians received help from somewhere else. For thousands of years, the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza remained a huge, seemingly unsolvable mystery. At least it was until 2013. That's when Pierre Talet, Gregory Marouard, and a team of French and Egyptian archaeologists made a discovery that could answer one of history's greatest mysteries, the riddle of the Great Pyramid. But before we get to that, let's backtrack a bit and trace how Thaler actually arrived at the most significant find of his career so far. In fact, he never liked digging around crowded, well-known archaeological sites like Giza and Saqqara. Instead, he preferred to work in natural areas, desert and inaccessible regions, because he believed that it was there, in untouched and remote places, that the greatest discoveries lay. It was this philosophy that led him to Wadi al-Jarf, a desert area on the Red Sea coast, far from Egypt's major cities. If you look at photos from Wadi al-Jarf, your first thought will probably be how desolate and unwelcoming this place looks. There seems to be nothing there but sand dunes, rock formations, and remains of ancient architecture that at first glance don't look very impressive. But Thale noticed something that others may have overlooked. Of particular interest to him were several seemingly ordinary limestone hills located several miles from the water. Carved into the rocky hillsides were 30 chambers, large enough to hold boats, Boats that, as would later be discovered, were large enough to carry massive limestone blocks transported all the way from Sinai. Thaley and his team, however, were not the first to spot this place. An Englishman named John Gardner Wilkinson had come across it some 200 years earlier. Wilkinson suggested that the ruins might have been part of a Greco-Roman necropolis. Then, about 120 years later, 
two French pilots, also interested in archaeology, spotted the site from the air. Neither Wilkinson nor the two pilots, who were forced to halt their explorations because of the Suez Canal crisis, had any success. It was the periphery-loving Thale who decided to pick up where the others had left off. He devoted himself to solving the mystery surrounding this strange complex, erected as it were in the middle of nowhere. For a long time, Thale had been exploring archaeological sites located practically in the middle of nowhere, but the results of his work were surprising. He found that the ancient Egyptians mined valuable materials from the Sinai Peninsula, such as turquoise and copper, which were extremely important for making tools and weapons. He also linked the ancient port of Ain Sukhna to these mining activities, suggesting that it served as a key trade hub for the import of materials into ancient Egypt. But when he began excavating at Wadi al Jarf, Thale could hardly have imagined that he would discover what could be the key to one of the ancient world's greatest mysteries. While working in the caves, set among limestone hills, Thale's team stumbled upon an almost intact trove of artifacts. The most important of these were whole rolls of papyrus, some stretching several meters in length, and by some miracle, preserved in remarkably good condition. Written in hieratic script, a cursive writing system in ancient Egypt, as well as in hieroglyphics, these papyri turned out to be the oldest surviving documents of their kind in the entire world. What initially made the discovery so significant is that finding Old Kingdom scrolls is quite rare. But the team working on the project didn't even suspect that they had discovered something even more important, so significant that the world's leading archaeologists dubbed these papyri the Red Sea Scrolls as an analogy to the famous Dead Sea Scrolls. Among the documents stood out the remains of the diary of a civil servant of Khufu's time named Merer. Merer's official position was inspector. According to his personal notes, he supervised a team of about 200 people. This large brigade was divided into subgroups. The diary itself states that about 40 boatmen worked under Merer's direct command in transporting the stones. This suggests that the rest were engaged in other related activities, in the quarry itself, in infrastructure, security, logistics, etc. The main task of his team was to transport various cargoes within and outside the borders of ancient Egypt. In his diary, which he updated twice a day, he noted in detail the activities of the team and the routes they took. The best preserved portions, Jarfs A and B, cover a period of about three months. They describe how the white limestone was transported to Giza from Tura. This is one of the most significant discoveries in Mera's notes. The ancient Egyptian city of Tura, located on the banks of the Nile, was famous for its limestone quarries. Limestone was an extremely important building material for the pyramids, perhaps even the most important. It was used both for the basic construction of the structures and for the white limestone facing that once covered the massive structure, but was lost over time. Mera and his team took the material from the quarries at Tura, transported it along the Nile and shipped it to Giza, where it was used for the pyramid's lining. In total, over two million blocks were used for the pyramid, each weighing up to 80 tons. If we consider this scale, the most logical solution for transporting the massive stone blocks from the mines to the construction site would indeed have been to carry them by huge boat across the water. One more key piece of evidence that links Mera's diary to Khufu and his pyramid is the fact that in his records he mentions how he reported to the noble Ankh Kaf. Ankh Kaf was considered to be Khufu's half-brother and may have acted as overseer during the construction of the pyramid. So far, there is no other known Ankh Kaf in the historical sources other than the one supposed to be Khufu's brother. Interestingly, in addition to the pyramid, this same Mera team was involved in other significant endeavors in the same period. Additional papyrus fragments from the archives show that in the 27th year of Khufu's reign, in question, Mera's men were involved in the construction of a port on the Mediterranean. This was probably a facility in the Delta to assist trade and transport along the northern coast. Also, the presence of these documents in the remote Red Sea port of Wadi al Jarf suggests that the same specialized teams were involved in expeditions to mine copper and turquoise. Although Mera's diary directly describes mainly the transportation of facing stones, it indirectly fits into the larger picture of state projects, from supplying Sinai miners with food and materials to providing the necessary resources for the construction of the pyramids. 
This suggests that the ancient Egyptian administration may have assigned the same workforce to different tasks according to the needs of the state. But does this solve the greatest archaeological mystery of all time? The logistics data may seem prosaic, but for the ancient Egyptians of Khufu's time, this was an important record detailing the greatest project of their age. At the same time, for us, it contains a vivid and very real snapshot of some of the way the pyramid was built. These records serve as a kind of well-preserved time capsule that allows us to see what life was like at the time the pyramids were built. Although the picture is incomplete and does not explain exactly how the blocks were assembled to form the pyramid, the discovery at Wadi al-Jarf at least tells us about how they were transported over vast distances. According to archaeologists, it is possible that the ancient Egyptians, with their excellent knowledge of irrigation and canal construction, used this very tactic to build their ambitious projects. If they could divert water from the Nile with such efficiency, they may have used other ingenious methods. But Egypt was not always on the rise. Its history records a terrifying moment, an age that nearly destroyed ancient Egypt. But you can learn more about that history in the video you see on the left.